Okay, good morning, everyone. My name is Kara. I'm one of the pastors on the team, and we are in week two of our Advent series, where we're looking at the genealogy of Jesus and these unexpected characters and, and the details that matter in every single part of the genealogy. Advent basically means arrival, and so during the season of Advent, which are these four weeks that we're leading up to Christmas, we, alongside with followers of Jesus, we both remember, we look back on the arrival of Jesus, and we look forward. We look forward to his arrival coming again, and each of these four weeks also um, correlate with a word, and so last week, uh, we lit, lit the candle of hope. Last week was about hope. And today we're going to light the candle of peace here. And when we do this, if you're following in our a Advent guide, uh, maybe you're also doing this at home as well. We are remembering the Prince of Peace that came in the birth of Jesus. And we are looking forward to the arrival and the promise of Jesus' peace to come. Advent is about anticipation and expectancy and the waiting. And so that's, that's the series that we're in. As Pastor Neely shared last week during this Advent series, we're sharing stories from Jesus' genealogy, four of the most unexpected characters. And they're all listed in the Gospel of Matthew. Their names are Rahab, Ruth, Bathsheba, and Tamar, who we're going to talk about today. And they're unexpected characters, scandalous characters, not only because they're listed here and they're women, the woman listed, but they're also Gentile women. They're not part of the family of Israel. They're outsiders. And each of their stories contain scandal, they contain brokenness, and they contain incredible nuance, which is what we're going to lean into together today. And so we're going to look at the story of Tamar, which is a heavy story. It's, it's a story that's a little bit more intense, a little bit more graphic. And so again, I just want to leave space if there are kids in the room, uh, that this is a great day to check them into Kid Town. Um, but before we get into that story, to leave a little bit of room, um, I just want to remind you of our Advent Guide. If you're interested in learning more about each of these stories that we're going through each week, maybe you picked up that Advent Guide in the hallway and you can do this at home. You can learn about the stories, engage with the season of Advent by lighting the candles by practicing the waiting and the expectancy. And in our Advent Guide, you can also learn about how people around the world are celebrating Advent, celebrating Christmas together. So let's talk about why we're doing this unconventional take on Advent. It's a little different. Um, it's exciting. I think it's going to be really, really powerful. But let's see where it comes from. It comes from the first six verses in the Gospel of Matthew. So if you have your Bibles, if you want to open, we're going to be in the, the first chapter of Matthew. Now, the Gospel of Matthew is the first of the four Gospels, right? Telling the story of Jesus. And I imagine, like, if you were Matthew and you got to pen this story, the most incredible story ever told, right? You get to pen the, the coming of the prophesied Messiah. I see the beginning of this account, and I'm like, what a snooze fest. He starts with the genealogy. Boring. When I was a kid, um, we'd call this the begets and the begats because it's just like the name after name of these dudes. They all have kind of funny names, and it just goes on and on. So why is this important? Because last week, when Neely was sharing this Advent series and why we're doing this, she shared um, that this, every detail matters, that every piece of this is important, right? So let's look at these details, because what's interesting in this genealogy is that in the first six verses, Matthew names not one, but all four of these Gentile women listed among the men in the ancestry of Jesus. So let's read Matthew chapter 1. This is a record of the ancestors of Jesus the Messiah, a descendant of David and Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac. Isaac was the father of Jacob. Jacob was the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah was the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar. Perez was the father of Hezron. 
Hezron was the father of Ram. Ram was the father of Aminadab. Aminadab was the father of Nashon. Nashon was the father of Salmon. Salmon was the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz was the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed was the father of Jesse. Jesse was the father of King David, and David was the father of Solomon, whose mother was Bathsheba, the widow of Uriah. So why does Matthew begin the Advent story with this genealogy? Not only that, but why on earth would he include women, the mothers listed in this patriarchal lineage? And it's because of this that the good news is revealed in every detail. That's our first point. The good news is revealed in every detail. So that means that every detail matters. Every story in here matters. Every name matters. There is a reason why these women are listed among the men. And the first detail we're going to look at is who. Who are the characters in the story today? There are two characters. Tamar is a woman, which means she is marginalized. She is a widow, which means she is powerless. And a Canaanite, which means she is an outsider. And then there's Judah. Now, Judah is a man in this story. It means his story, his narrative is centered. He has the power. He has the control. He's also a descendant of Abraham, which means he's in the family of Israel. He's an insider in this story. So now, the story of Tamar takes place all the way in the book of Genesis, in Genesis chapter 38. And this is such a strange chapter because this chapter is right in the middle of one of the most famous stories in the Old Testament, in the story of Joseph. You might be familiar with Joseph's story. He's the second to youngest son of Jacob, of his 12 sons, and they hated him because not only was he their dad's favorite, he had these wild dreams where he dreamt that his family was bowing down to him, and, and he told them this, right? And he gets this fancy, colorful coat. His brothers hated him so much that they made a plan to kill him. And this is when we see Judah show up. Judah is one of the brothers, and we see Judah's character here for the first time, because the brothers are conspiring together. They're like, we hate Joseph. We want to kill him. And Judah steps in, but not in the way you'd expect. Judah steps in to say, if we kill him, what good does that do me? He wanted more. Let's sell him instead so that we can gain something. We see Judah's character of greed and self-centeredness, and so he convinces the brothers to sell their brother into slavery so that he could gain something. And right after this happens, immediately after they sell him into slavery, we go to chapter 38, which is where our story takes place, and instead of following Joseph, we follow Judah through this chapter. At the beginning of chapter 38, it says that Judah then leaves his brothers behind. He goes to live in the land of Adullam, and he marries a Canaanite woman, again, an outsider, and they have three sons. Their names are Er, Onan, and Shelah. Judah then chooses Tamar, this is where Tamar shows up, to be the wife of his eldest son, Er. Now, the eldest son, was to receive the double share of the inheritance. So this is pretty good for Tamar, right? She's marrying the eldest son. It's bad. It's real bad. Uh, The scripture says that Er is so wicked that God takes his life and leaves Tamar a widow. Now, last week, Pastor Neely talked about what It meant to be a widow at this time, to not have any rights or a role in society. And she talked about this idea of a kinsman redeemer um, in the story of Ruth. And in the story of Ruth, that redeemer shows up in an obscure relative in Boaz. But what happens here um, is actually the Leveret law because Judah has three sons, right? And so when the eldest son dies, the Leveret law would state that Tamar must marry the second son, and that if they have a child together, that child would receive the double share of the inheritance as if that was the child of the eldest brother. 
So Judah follows the Leveret law, and he gives Tamar to his second son, Onan. And Onan is just like Judah. He is full of greed and self-centeredness. He cares about what he can gain. And he knows that if he and Tamar have a child, that that child will receive the double share of the inheritance in the name of his brother, not him. And so what he does is Onan keeps Tamar from getting pregnant. Every time he is intimate with his wife, Tamar, he practices what we'll call Old Testament birth control. He keeps her from getting pregnant, okay? This is a PG-13 message. <laughs> you can read about it if you want. But this is a wicked act, right? And the scripture says that God is offended by Onan, by this injustice, by his greed and his control and his abuse over Tamar. And so God takes Onan's life as well. Tamar is a widow again. And at this point, Judah is spooked. He's like, is something going on with Tamar? <laughs> and this is what he says in Genesis 38, verse 11. Judah says to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, go back to your parents' home and remain a widow until my son Shelah is old enough to marry you. But Judah didn't really intend to do this because he was afraid Shelah would die, would also die like his two brothers. So Tamar went back to live in her father's home. So sending Tamar to her father's home, I just want to be clear, does not free her from this leveret law, right? She still belongs to this family. She's still connected to this family. So when Judah sends her home, he just wants her gone, right? He's essentially disowning her, but not technically disowning her because she still belongs to this family. She's a widow, but her father could not remarry her to someone else because she still belongs to this family. But we know Judah has no intention, right? Of, of, he says he's going to wait till his eldest son is grown. But we know he has no intention of following the Leveret law. So she is in this place of legal limbo, right? Because a woman did not have a role or a place unless she was connected to a man. As a twice-widowed woman, she's without worth or purpose in society, without that connection. So... I want us to think of this not as where does Tamar belong, but it's to whom does she belong because she's being used. She's been abused by every man in the story so far. She's been victimized by these men. So she is at her father's home. She has no resources. She has no advocate and she has no future. But Tamar is smart. And we see that Tamar is brave. Time passes, and the youngest son of Judah is now grown. And so she knows for sure that Judah is not going to follow up with his promise. He's not going to follow the Leveret law. More time passes, and Judah's wife dies. And Tamar gets word that Judah is now going to be traveling. And she knows the direction that he's going to be traveling. And so she devises a plan she takes off her widow's garments. She disguises herself with a veil. And then she waits along the path, along the road that she knows Judah will be taking. Now, Judah, she knows the type of man that Judah is. We know the type of man Judah is, right? We, we've seen a bit of his character, but even more so, Tamar would know the character of this man, right? Judah sees her, he comes along the road. He leaves the road. He makes an assumption about her veiled appearance. He leaves the path and he propositions her in exchange for a young goat. And Tamar asks, what guarantee will you give me that you're going to come back and bring this young goat if I do this for you? And he gives her his staff, his seal, and his cord, which would be his identity markers. He basically is giving her his identification as this guarantee to be with her. Afterwards, Judah leaves. She returns home, puts back on her widow's clothing. 
Now later, Judah sends his friend with that young goat. Go and find that woman. Give her this young goat so I can have my stuff back. Um, and he can't find her, right? He, he's asking around. It's actually getting really embarrassing now because he can't find her. And so he comes back to Judah. And he says, the town, they don't even know who this person is that you're looking for. And Judah, again, is full of pride. And he says, I'm not going to be the laughing stock. So he cuts his losses. He says, she can keep those, those items. I'm not going to keep looking for her. Then three months later, Judah gets word that his daughter-in-law Tamar is now pregnant. He knows that he didn't follow through with his promise to marry her to Sheila, right? So he gets angry. And this is in Genesis 38, verse 24. About three months later, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has acted like a prostitute, and now because of this, she's pregnant. And look at Judah's first response. He says, bring her out and let her be burned, Judah demanded. But as they were taking her out to kill her, she sent this message to her father-in-law. The man who owns these things made me pregnant. Look closely. Whose seal and cord and walking stick are these? Judah recognized them immediately and said, She is more righteous than I am because I didn't arrange for her to marry my son, Shelah. And Judah never slept with Tamar again. He said, She is more righteous than I am. That's wild. This is the beginning, just the, t the tiny beginning we can see in Judah of some confession. I didn't, I didn't hold up my end of the bargain, right? And repentance, taking ownership. And this is what we see in this story. This is the next detail, the what. That we see transformation because the victim, Tamar, becomes righteous. And Judah, the abuser, we'll see in a minute, becomes the protector. There is transformation here. The victim becomes righteous. And the fact that Judah calls Tamar righteous might challenge your belief of what righteousness looks like, right? We might read this story and not say, oh, <laughs> Tamar is righteous in this story, right? right? It challenges our idea and our definition. And I want to read this quote by Walter Brueggemann about this story of Tamar. He says, in the midst of this sordid story of sexuality, there is a new understanding of righteousness. The story may give us pause about the usual bourgeois dimensions of sin. What is taken most seriously is not a violation of sexual convention, but damage to the community, which includes a poor, diminished female. So this challenges our idea of righteousness and justice, right? Could it be that God was more offended by Judah's denial of justice? Could it be that that was more egregious than deviation from the sexual ethic? What does it mean to live in righteousness and to pursue justice? And we know because it's in scripture in Micah 6, 8. No, O oh people, the Lord has told you what is good, and this is what he requires of you, to do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. And the Lord has told us what is good, righteousness, and justice, and mercy, and transformation. And we see Tamar trans transformed from victim to righteous. And we see the beginning of Judah's transformation from abuser to protector. Only a few chapters later, because after this, this chapter 38, we go back to the story of Joseph. We see a different Judah show up. Because Joseph, at this point, is now in a place of extreme power. He is second in command to Pharaoh in Egypt. And there's a widespread, devastating famine in the land that forces Joseph's brothers, including Judah, to all come and beg for food before him. Now, there's 
a few more things that happen in this story, but the youngest brother, Benjamin, ends up being accused for a crime that he did not commit, right? And who steps in but Judah? Judah steps in to protect the youngest, most vulnerable brother. He says, I told our father that I would protect him. I'm keeping my promise. Take me instead of him. He puts himself in harm's way. And this is incredible because even though we never see Tamar's name listed again after this chapter in chapter 38, she doesn't show up in the story again, but we see her impact in Judah's transformation, right? And even though she doesn't show up again in this story, we see her legacy because her name is now forever listed in the ancestry of Jesus among these men. Amen. And so this is what this tells us. The next detail is why. The arrival of Jesus means that our messy stories can be transformed. These are messy stories in scripture. And God knows that our stories are messy as well, right? But that doesn't mean that there isn't transformation. The arrival of Jesus means he's not afraid of our mess. If you think about the birth of Christ, it's not these pristine ceramic figurines, right? It's actually messy. And Jesus enters into it. Author and poet Tasha Jun says this, that Jesus came with skin and scent and color and culture. And it matters. It matters that this is how Jesus entered into the world, entered into our mess and lived as a human. And maybe we can find ourselves in the mess of Tamar's story. I have a friend who told me that this story reminds her of the strength of women in her own family history who fought to survive by any means necessary. And so when she reads Tamar's story, she sees her own story. And maybe you see yourself in Tamar's story today. Maybe we find ourselves like her, a victim of power and of circumstance trapped in a system that is designed to separate us from our humanity. Maybe there are things that have happened to you that are outside of your control, that make you feel damaged, that make you feel like you have no advocate and no future. And if that's you, I, I want you to hear these words. That the good news for, is for us today. Emmanuel, God, with us. Author and trauma therapist Andy Kolber says this, that Jesus did not spiritually bypass his humanity. And for trauma survivors in particular, I think of what it means that our God knows what it's like to exist in a body, an abused body at that. Jesus could have come so many ways, but he chose to show us how deeply we are loved by joining us in our humanity, our God with us. And so that this advent, this arrival of Jesus is our hope and is our peace because God is near in our mess. He is with us. Because of Jesus, you have an advocate. Because of Jesus, you're never alone. And then maybe today we find ourselves in the mess of this story, like Judah, focusing more on what we can gain than looking out for the needs of others. And if that's you, maybe there's something that you need to confess and repent today. Where's the beginning of that transformation? Who are the marginalized that you can be an advocate for, that you can advocate for justice for? Because whatever your story is that you're carrying into this Christmas season, into Advent and into these, this arrival of Jesus, whatever you've done, whatever's been done to you, whatever your family history, whatever your baggage, the good news is for us today. The good news of Jesus coming near, Amen. near to our humanity, near to our wounds and our pain, 
This is the good news of Jesus. And because these messy stories have been included, it's good news for us because we know that we can be included as well because Tamar's name is listed, right? That our stories are not too messy for God. And because we've been included, we get to include others as well. And this Christmas Eve, we're going to have three services here at 4 p.m., 6 p.m., and 11 p.m. And this is a great time to invite someone to be included. Maybe you know somebody with a story like this. Maybe you know somebody that needs the good news of Jesus. Because we know it changes everything. It might feel weird to invite them but the good news of Jesus will change their life. The arrival of Jesus brings transformation. It brings a hope. In the dark places, Jesus is our light, right? In the weary places, Jesus is our hope. And in the chaos of our lives, in the mess and the destruction, Jesus is our peace. Jesus is our Prince of Peace. And so this is good news for us. And it's good news for everyone, everywhere. And so we want to invite others to come and receive this good news as well. In just a moment, we're going to hear a song written by Pastor Royce. I want you to pay attention to these words as we listen to this song. But I want to end just by reading one more passage from the book of Jeremiah. And it says this, The time is coming, declares the Lord, when I will raise up a righteous descendant from David's line, and he will rule as a wise king. He will do what is just and right in the land. During his lifetime, Judah will be saved and Israel will live in safety, and his name will be the Lord is our righteousness. The Lord is our righteousness. Let's pray. Jesus, we are so thankful that your arrival brings hope. We are so thankful that you are just, and you are good, and you are kind, and you are near, and you see us in the mess of our stories. Whatever that looks like, whatever our family baggage, whatever our history, God, you know every detail and you say that every detail matters. There is nothing that is too much for you. And so today we turn to you as our God of peace, our God of hope, and Emmanuel, God with us. Amen. Can hope be found after shame? Can love rewrite my strife? Just claim. story 
tells me your love remains and I see Jesus he sure Yeshua, Yeshua, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God with us, we see a Savior, a Savior, Redeemer, Lamb of God. We see Jesus, Yeshua, Yeshua, Emmanuel, Emmanuel, God with us, God with us, a Savior, a Savior,